This video is brought to you by Sporlin, quality, integrity, and tradition. All right, we've got a reach-in cooler today that um, obviously is frozen up, but they're also complaining about it freezing all the food on the top. Notice how they're double panning and stuff. So they actually called me about that. They didn't even bring up that the bottom wasn't working. Maybe it is, I don't know, but it's all frozen solid. So um, even though there's two separate temperature controllers, they work together, meaning that um, if, uh, it just depends. Like this particular one right here, the, this is a pressure control, okay? That pressure control controls the temperature for the top section. The way that it works is, is it also works as a low pressure safety. So whenever the bottom is running, the top runs. So if the bottom is iced up and it's constantly trying to bring the product temperature down, the top is gonna continue to run and run and run. It's just kind of a silly setup. I like the ones better where they have two separate temperature controllers for the top and the bottom, but Regardless, um, they also have a defrost timer right here. That's actually just an off cycle timer and that's only for the top. So that way it does a shutdown from midnight till 8 a.m. in the morning. That just shuts off the top. They're not supposed to be leaving any food in the top at nighttime. They take it out, they put it in the bottom. So we're gonna start by defrosting the bottom. Uh, that very well could be our problem, um, but we'll investigate more. Sometimes people get back in here and they start adjusting on this pressure control things like that so we'll check everything so yeah the ice is super thick i just got my pump sprayer right here with just some hot water in it we're just melting it as it's draining or looks like it might be draining i don't know maybe it's plugged up too we're just melting it slowly and then we'll get in there and check the sensors all right so we got the unit put all back together it's operating it's all defrosted we have our probes on it we're checking the refrigerant pressures they look to be okay we're looking for about 25 to 30 degrees over ambient temperature um, let's see, it's 35, 34 degrees in the box right now. It should be shutting off here any second. 73 in the yes. building, 83, 93, 103. Condensing temp, suction pressure is about where I think it should be. Now, when we had the coil apart, we tested the sensors in ice water and they ohmed out at about 16,000 ohms, um, which is about where they be, or 16K ohms. But then what I noticed is, now I use this for troubleshooting purposes. If you don't know, you can do this. You can throw a display on a control that doesn't have it. And we're reading an E2 error, which is an evaporator coil sensor, which is the blue one. But it tested fine, so that's interesting. Because it tested where it should be. It looks like the unit's pumping down right now. So we're gonna let it, we're gonna see where it turns back on at, just to see. Um, but I think we're gonna have a bad temperature controller because the sensor's tested okay. They ohmed out where they should be and we're still getting that E2 error. And it's weird because if I unplug it and plug it back in, it'll go away, and then it comes back after a while. All right, that's weird because now I plugged in a good sensor and it's reading 34 where it should be and we're not getting the E2 error, but this guy's ohming out. So I don't, I don't get it. I don't, I think there's still something wrong with that control. Regardless, we're gonna end up changing the sensor and then we'll probably change the control too because this is funky for sure. All right, I'm all over the place today, but I decided just to change the sensors for now because we're going to be coming back with a drain pan and we'll check on the temp control then. Okay, go ahead and pull. Tell me when you get them. I got them. Go ahead and untape them. So I have someone on the other side pulling them back through and then uh, we'll pull out the old sensors here in a minute. All right, much better. Got the sensors replaced, got them tied in there, back there, ran up into here. You always tie a knot so that way they get stuck and don't pull out. So we just have the display, and, and I don't know if I explained enough earlier. So this display is just temporary. These controls can accept a display. Sometimes they have them. This one happens to have an analog one. But to make your life easy, you can plug in a display to one of these controls and it'll still give you error messages and temperatures. So earlier with the old sensors, I was able to confirm that this was accurate and it actually still is. 55 degree return, 54, that's, I'm happy with that. So we're waiting for the delay. And then I also adjusted on the pressure control because that is our temperature controller for the top. If I didn't already say it, you got a temp control for the bottom, you've got a solenoid valve for the bottom, you have a solenoid valve for the top that's controlled just by this defrost clock. And then also, whenever the bottom is running, the top is running because it uses this low pressure control for the uh, temperature control for the top. So that low pressure control is also a uh, low loss safety. Whenever it runs out of gas, it shuts down the system too. So kind of a weird design, but because this control wasn't working right and it was constantly icing up, 
the box was constantly trying to bring the bottom down to temperature, therefore it was freezing the top because the top always runs whenever the bottom's calling. But if the bottom satisfies, the top can still run until the pressure gets to where it cuts off for the top at the right temperature, if that makes sense. So Delfield is the manufacturer of that unit and Delfield makes two different styles for this box. They make the style where there's two separate temperature controllers, two separate solenoid valves, where a temperature controller independently controls each section, right? You have the cold rail and the base section. Then they share a common condensing unit. This particular style, the bottom section has its own control, as you guys saw, and that's what controls the bottom. But then the cold rail has a defrost timer or an off cycle timer. It's not really defrost. It's an off cycle timer that shuts the unit off on the top. You are not supposed to leave the top running on these cold rail units. They need off cycle because uh, if you've ever seen these before, if people don't use the off cycle, what can actually happen is a uh, condensation can slowly start to build up in the cold rail cavity and over time that condensation will start freezing and it'll start destroying the inside of the box plus on top of that if you think about it uh, you, you have frost and ice right uh, ice acts as an insulator so once you start getting enough frost and ice up on that cold rail it starts getting thick to where the pans can't fit in there and stuff um, it actually brings the temperature of the cold rail up to 32 degrees and 32 degrees on a static cold rail is not going to, it's not going to work right. Uh, typically on these cold rail units, they run the temperature down to typically between 13 and 17 degrees um, air temperature underneath the pans with the pans fully sealing everything in order to maintain a 40 ish degree product temperature. Now, static cold rails are not the most, um, efficient way to cool the food up in the top. And something to understand too, is that, uh, reaching coolers in general, they're meant for uh, product storage. They're not meant to bring product down to temperature. So the customers can't be loading warm food into these boxes, it will ruin the entire uh, unit's efficiency. And if they start putting warm food in there, they will start seeing issues. In fact, I've got some uh, a customer where I just had this happen where they've their cold rails, uh, they're not working right. And they're like, it's always too hot, you know? Well, what's happening is they're set up to turn off like they should be at nighttime, but the customer wasn't removing the food. So therefore the cold rail would get up to 45, 50 degrees and the food would get up to 45, 50, but then it would automatically turn back on at eight in the morning. Well, then the box could never recover and it starts affecting the entire unit when that happens. So understanding how these units are supposed to work is so important. And as service technicians, oftentimes, because the manufacturers, especially when you're dealing with like chain restaurants and stuff, the manufacturers do not do a good enough job of educating the customer on how their equipment works. So it doesn't matter what manufacturer you tend to find this, especially with corporations, someone in the corporate office knows how this box is supposed to work. And someone in the corporate office knows that they're supposed to remove the, the food from the top every single night, but that is not passed down. Okay. Now, the reason why I say the manufacturers are not doing a good enough job, if you think about it, really, it's the corporations, the restaurants fault, right? But the manufacturers are the ones that are getting the black eye from this. So that's why I say it's the manufacturers fault, because if the manufacturers themselves did a better job of training the end user on how to use their equipment, then even though it would take extra effort from the manufacturer, it would actually make the manufacturer look better in the long run, okay? But regardless, I want to stress the importance of understanding proper sequence of operation. And I also want to dive a little bit deeper into that pressure control that is controlling the temp for the top section, okay? So to clarify, the bottom section has its own temperature controller, right? And the top section runs off of that pressure control. It's using the theory that at any given saturation temperature, right, or any pressure, there is a corresponding saturation temperature of that refrigerant, okay? So uh, on the side of my wall, you guys can kind of see I have a pressure chart right here, okay? And that's going to tell us for every refrigerant at a certain pressure, it is a certain temperature, okay? So using that theory, if we know we want to control the temperature in a static cold rail like we have up top that's using convection, okay? Um, we know that at a certain pressure, that is a certain temperature, okay? That refrigerant is. And there's some uh, um, heat transfer that's gonna happen in there. So therefore, if we set the pressure control to cut out at a certain pressure, 
the refrigerant will be a certain temperature, just like I said. And I know it sounds like I'm repeating myself, but we need to drill that into people's heads. So in this situation, that pressure control acts as a temperature controller and as a low loss safety. If the system ever ran out of refrigerant, it would shut off the compressor. But at the same time, it will keep the compressor running on the top section until it gets to a certain pressure, which corresponds to the temperature at which they want the uh, refrigerant to be to have the proper heat transfer to keep the food in the cold rail at a certain temperature. Now, clearly you guys saw the flaw in this one. We had a failed temperature sensor that wasn't working right. It caused the bottom to consistently run and froze up the bottom. Now, that ice, like I said, starts to act as an insulator. And then the bottom section will start getting warmer and warmer. But because the design is set up to where the top section runs whenever the bottom is running, the bottom's never going to shut off. So it's just going to be a vicious cycle. And then they're going to start freezing the food in the top section, right? And that's what the problem we were having this one with this one. So um, understanding and really thinking about the operation of these boxes helps you to be able to troubleshoot. So I knew right off the bat when I opened up the bottom section and saw it was frozen up, it's like, you know what, more than likely that's the cause of why they're freezing the food in the top because I understood the sequence of operation and how this unit operated, okay? Um, you know, I don't understand how every single unit that I walk up onto operates, right? I have a general understanding of basic refrigeration and I have some experience from making a lot of mistakes over my career. So it's easy for me to walk up and say, okay, this seems like a basic unit, but I always still will give a call to the manufacturer, lean on them, get on the phone with technical support and just kind of pick their brain. What's the sequence of operation? What's your control strategy? What kind of temperatures are you looking for? And then it's really important. Once you do find that information out, write it down, write down what the operating pressure should be, write down what the temperatures typically should be. Because if you work for like chain restaurants, like I do, you work on a lot of the same stuff. So you don't have to keep calling the manufacturer every single time bogging up their tech support phone lines. Right? So I reserve the right to, or I reserve my phone calls to them, uh, for stuff that I truly need once I've gotten information and I write it down. And the cool thing is that we have these really cool things in our pockets, right? That have all kinds of apps that we can store information on and we can put, I have a note app in here and I'll put notes in there. Dell field refrigerator, operating pressures, manufacturer suggested uh, cut in and cut out of pressure controls. And I put it all in my phone so that I don't constantly have to lean on the manufacturer and call them for silly things repetitively over and over and over again, okay? So I'm not a perfect technician, nor will I ever be, but I'm always striving to be the best that I can. And that's that's all that I can do is just try my best. So I encourage all of you guys to do that. And I encourage all of you guys to share that information once you do gain it. So that way, maybe you can help another technician and help them to not have to make some of the same mistakes as you do. That's the whole premise and what my YouTube channel has become. I, you know, I started making these for my employees. It turned into something else. I hit the public button. And I just share my experience, my mistakes, and my success stories. That way, maybe you guys can have the same success and or not make the same mistakes as I have, okay? I really, really appreciate you guys making it to the end of this video. Uh, the support from all of you guys is so awesome. If you uh, don't already and you're interested in supporting the channel, the easiest way to do so is simply watch the videos from beginning to end without skipping through anything. That's the simplest way, okay? Uh, there's other methods if you're interested in doing so. Uh, if you're looking at purchasing any tools, go to truetechtools.com. If you like their pricing and the selection of tools that they have, I have an offer code with them. Big picture, one word. We'll get you an 8% discount on checkout. I get a small commission when you use that offer code. Um, if you know what you're going to purchase from True Tech Tools, you can shoot me an email and let me know and I can generate an affiliate link. You can still use my offer code. Gets me a little bit extra percentage on my commission. Uh, you can support the channel via Patreon, PayPal, YouTube channel memberships. Um, there's all kinds of different methods. Uh, there's links in the show notes to all of them. So feel free if you guys are interested, but you don't have to do so. Uh, there's also my website, hvacrvideos.com. We have cool merchandise available on there. Hats are the number one seller, beanies, sweaters, t-shirts, all kinds of different designs, uh, coming soon stickers. So I really appreciate you all and, uh, we will catch you on the next one. Okay.